Today, we hear about uh, one of, I think, probably the three most important mathematicians in history, um, Leonard Euler. So Trey, Zach, and Braden are gonna talk to us about that. All right, can, uh, can everybody online hear okay? Test, test. They should be hearing me. We can hear you. All right, cool. All right, guys, it's all yours. So the extraordinary sons of Euler, not Euler, Zach, um, Trey, Zach, Braden, got names confused. Uh, but the history of Euler, he was born in Switzerland in 1707. He studied with the last guy um, that we found out with last presentation. He was his mentor. Uh, his student, Euler was his student. Uh, Euler uh, showed genius from a young age. Um, he, and then every, he, Euler appointed for himself like every Saturday to uh, ask help for problems that from uh, Jonah that he was unable to do. And Jonah was not known to have a great temper. So every now and then he got angry with um, Johan. Yeah, Johan, sorry. Okay, yeah. It'd be cool if it was Jonah. Yeah, but... <laughs> Johan. Uh, then at 19, he started um, publishing papers, uh, high quality, and won a prize from the French Academy uh, for the best place to put a mass on the ship, which he's actually never seen a ship at that time before. Um, his works filled over 70 large volumes. His best, best works were the, uh, was this and, um, and 1748, which uh, was, is compared to uh, Euclid's Elements, which we learned about a little. Uh, and then in 1727, he um, was accepted a job at St. Petersburg uh, Academ Academia. Um, in the area of medicine uh, and philosophy. Then in 1733, he finally received a mathematics chair when Johann's son, Daniel, stepped down. So Euler got the job in medicine and psychology because Daniel was at the mathematics chair before him. Then in 1730s, in the, the mid-1730s, Euler began losing his sight in his right eye but then in 1741, he took another position at Berlin Academy until um, under uh, Frederick the Great, uh, Friedrich the Great, sorry. And the king, uh, the German king, uh, referenced to Euler's vision problems, calling him the mathematical cyclops and regarded him as an unassuming scholar and too much, too much the quiet and not uh, sophisticated, sorry, words. Uh, and all that led him go and made him go back to St. Petersburg. Uh, Euler presented a welcome change from his fellow peers. Uh, he did not, he found it, his peers found it hard to share their thoughts, but Euler did not. He actually cared deeply about teaching but in the, then in 1771, he began losing sight in his normal eye. And Euler was blessed with a great, and something, Euler was blessed with a great memory that allowed him to not only memorize the first 100 primes, but also the squares, uh, the cubes, the fourths, fifths, and sixth powers of them all. As a boy, he memorized uh, the, I don't know how you say this. Um, yeah, and was able to re uh, recite it perfectly uh, half a century later. He influenced modern day mathematics, uh, notations and formula formats. So that's why a lot of our math look similar to his. And the last days he spent playing with his grandchildren and discussing the latest theories about the planet Uranus before he dying on September the 7th, 1783. 
All right, so his proof of the reciprocals of the squares, we can start on the right slide. I did, okay. Um, so the reciprocals of the squares, so that's with pen. One over one squared plus one over two squared, et cetera. Um, and then one over two squared. So basically no one could figure out what this equals and until he came in. And so he, um, he sees that you've got, he basically, he takes this and basically he takes it and it's, it's hard to tell like where exactly he got it, but basically everyone knew that the reciprocals of the, the sum of the reciprocals of the squares was less than two. That's not less than was less than two, but no one knew exactly what its value was. So they had that much to go on. So he takes sine because you've got the sine chart and you've got right there is pi. And so he knew that there was something with that involved in it because there's zeros at every integer pi value. So he takes that idea and he, um, this is Taylor expansion, I think, is when he goes from there to there. So he takes, he puts this and then he takes X and he takes out an X from everything. So from there over to there. And so now he has sine of X over X. So they know that value and And so from, I'm getting lost again. Well, I've confused myself and probably all of you too. What part did I miss? Yeah, you have, I think you finished that. Okay, sure. So, well, go to, the, go to the previous one. So that first line right there, mm -hmm. that, do you remember when Newton expanded his thing? Like he was able to figure out an expansion for the square root of one plus X or something. I mean, yeah, that. Uh, they would have known how to do that for like sine and cosine and all of the standard functions. Mm -hmm. And so that he, they, they would have known that this first equation was true and it's pretty it's pretty easy mm -hmm. to see why it would have to be true and all he did was divide by x and got that yeah. yeah and i mean if you divide through by x you get that second line right there and then what he's doing is he's yeah he's saying i claim that sine x over x is actually also equal to that product yeah so he takes also equal to that product he takes that and says that they have the same thing and then he says that it's all equal to pi squared over six. And that's what I can go to the next slide. So he takes this and he has this formula. And so he takes, for example, two, three, and six. You can do it with any number. He took two, three, and six because they're easy numbers to work with and he sets it equal to that. So basically anytime you put in an integer value that is two, three, or six, it will equal zero. But if you put in zero, then it'll equal one. So this equation when using integers can only be equal to zero or one, which is also true of this. So basically he, all he has to do is plug in any integer value for this, and this goes to infinity and then it equals to that. Now, that's, I mean, so you have one minus x over two times one yeah. minus x over three times one minus x over six. Yeah. This is just an algebra problem. Mm -hmm. You just multiply yeah. that out. If you multiply that out, what happens if you multiply the numbers together? One, one, one. 
Mm -hmm. You get what? One. One. Okay. How could I figure out the X term? Well, I mean, you just, what, all you have to do is multiply this yeah. out. There's nothing mysterious going on. Yeah. Okay. You just multiply it out. You combine the X terms. You're mm -hmm. going to get negative one times X. Yeah. How do you get the X cubed term? You multiply all the X terms together. What's two, what's one half times one third times one sixth? One over 36. 36. Yeah. I mean, this is, you're just doing algebra. Yeah. Math or hammer. Yeah. And if you were to put like a uh, four and for the X, you would get, would you get a value that's different than zero one? Yes, like right. There, it's not, it's not true that if you plug in any integer, that's not zero. Yeah, just the integer with it. The, the integer that X is sitting over. So like if you plug in two, you would get zero. If you plug in three, you would get zero. Mm -hmm. If you plug in six, you would get zero. Yeah. So the whole point of this, if you multiply it out, by the way, can people on online hear what I'm saying right now, or is it just impossible to hear? Yeah, I can hear fine. Right. So if you, I mean, uh, you know, look, the reason that we're looking at this product equaling this is because you can see that you can, you can write a polynomial as a product of its of factors that involve the roots of that thing. So what are the roots of that equation on the right hand side? What are the roots of that? What are the things that make it zero? Two, Two three, and six. Yes. Yeah. And so so that's the that's the key. The way that you can write that polynomial on the right as it's as a product of a bunch of factors is uh, is by finding the roots, which in this case happens to be two, three, and six. So he he sets that up from they know that p of x is equal to one minus x over a. This is messy. And so on. So basically, he's taking three of these and putting in two, three, six, and that's how he went to that. And he's not going to just do a finite product, he's going to do an infinite product. Yes. That was already. Okay, so we got to there. Wait, no, we didn't. Okay. So from, from that, where am I on the page? Right there. So he takes, nope, let's take that. He takes that and basically just rearranges it. And then We didn't put in the blank page that we were supposed to have. Okay. Um, ignore that. This is a blank page. So he has f of x is equal to one minus x over i times one minus or no, plus x over pi. Well, I guess if I had done over negative pi, it would have been the same. So basically, he takes this, and then he also has one minus x over two pi. This is messy. One minus x. And he takes that forever. And so what he has is he has this for one, two, three. So then any pi value he puts in, this is going back to the sign that we had before. So it's, 
is going back to this equation right here. Um, so what are the roots of sine? Like what are, what are the things that make the sine function zero? Pi, negative pi, two pi, negative two pi, et cetera. Yeah. And zero is not a root, correct? I mean, if you plug yeah. zero in, you know that you're plugging zero into that polynomial right there, which, what, what are you gonna get if you plug zero in for that? Indeterminate. No. For the on the right hand side, you're gonna get you're gonna get one. In fact, in calculus, oh, yeah, for this. one of the first things you learn in limits is that the limit as x goes to zero of sine x over x is one. Yeah. So sine x over x appears to be indeterminate, yes. But yeah. if you write it as a polynomial like this, mm -hmm. it's it's not. You can plug in x equal to zero and get one. Mm -hmm. the output. So he takes that forever. And then basically he uses the thing from before and rearranges this. Um, he uses the, the thing from before where, which side was that on? Um, so then he goes back and he's using this, the fact that these two are equal to each other to create that equation there. And so from this equation, he takes out, this is where he takes out the plan. No, what is that also equal to? This is also equal to one over, is this one's one over six or five over six? No, this no. Is, it's equal to one, it's equal to that other polynomial that you had for it. Right there. Yeah, the pi squared over six. No, 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 no. No? Go back one slide. Nope, you're going too fast. Go to, go to the next slide. Next one. Okay, so that is equal to sine x over x. Why? Well, because, yeah. because, so write this, right? One minus x over pi. That's one of the factors of that thing because pi is a root, correct? One plus x over pi is another factor. But what happens when you multiply those two things together, Brandon? Yes. And on the other hand, you have one minus x over two pi, right? Mm -hmm. And so then you've got the... Right, and then one plus x over two pi, you're gonna have these, right? When you multiply those together and combine them, combine them, you get that. Yeah, and that's so the... That is also equal to what's on the previous slide. Mm -hmm. Go to the previous slide. It's also equal to that in an expanded form. And you that also have on here the squares, the reciprocals. Yes. There. That's, yeah, that's going to be a key thing. Yeah. So he's going to take that. So he sees the squares in the reciprocals and he, he knows that this is all equal. To pi squared over six. Uh, no. no. Where does he get the other side? Because he sets that equal. What do you have on the next slide, Brady? Let me see. Yeah, um, that's too quick. Okay, so. Because I, I was, I can't figure out where he goes between these two. Yeah, so here's what happened. So it went like this. This is equal to also one minus x squared over three factorial plus x to the fourth over four factorial minus et cetera. Yes? Yeah, so he puts, yeah. So yeah, show the previous mm -hmm. slide. That, that, so that's, it's, it's also equal to that, correct? Yeah. And what happens, so I know that this guy is equal to this guy, yeah? Mm -hmm. Or hang, hang on, go to the next slide. Yeah, these two guys are equal, yeah? So then what? You say, well, what would happen if I were to multiply this thing out? Like I'm just going back to ninth grade algebra here. What would happen if I were to multiply these things out? What would be like the constant term? What would be the constant term if I were to multiply these things together? There'd be one, 
Yeah. And what would happen here? Think about it. How could I get an x squared term? Well, one way I could get an x squared term would be by taking this and then all the, all ones after that. Do you see that? Yeah. So let me just say this is going to be plus. I don't know. I'm going to figure out what has to be multiplied by x squared. If I take negative x squared over pi squared times one times one times one times one, uh, what am I left with? Isn't it like negative one over pi squared? Yeah. Yeah. And then what else? Okay. Uh, how else could I get an x squared? Well, I could use this term right here. And then I could take ones everywhere else. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So then what would that give me? X squared times minus one over four pi squared. Yeah. What would the next, what would, and then, and then I could keep doing this. Yeah. So I could say, well, I could take this guy times all these ones. I'm just multiplying this out. This is like algebra. Yeah. I'm figuring out what has to be sitting next to x squared. The one came from just multiplying all the ones together. So then what are you going to get? Minus one over nine pi, oops, this should be four pi squared, correct? Okay, minus, et cetera, okay? But then, so like, I, do you see what's happening? And then, and then you would have like x to the fourth times, times something, yeah, plus, et cetera. But here's what's interesting. You know what the coefficient of x squared is. It's right here. The coefficient of x squared is sitting right there, yes? So what has to be true about this thing right here and, and this number that's sitting right there? They have to be equal. Is the four factorial supposed to be five factorial? Yes, that's supposed to be five, thank you, five factorial, yes. So negative one over three factorial equals what? Negative one over pi squared, negative one over four pi squared, negative one over nine pi squared. And you're like, wow, what if I just multiply through by a negative sign? What's gonna happen? Uh, it goes away, right? The negative sign goes away, you end up with that, okay? And then I can multiply through by pi squared, yeah? And then what am I gonna end up with? You get pi squared over three factorial, which is six, equals one plus one over two squared plus one over three squared plus et cetera, right? So it's basically just, it's basically just high school algebra on steroids. Yeah? That's it. Wait, so the three factorial is like the three times two times one. Three times two times one. Three factorial is three times two times one. Four factorial, four times two times two times. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah. But I'm just trying to, how did we get it to one? So why are those two things equal? Well, yeah. okay. So go. Can you go back? No. Yeah. Yeah. They already knew. They already knew. Uh, so go back. Go back to the previous slide. They already knew that this identity held. Yes. That's actually fairly easy to do. They they took derivatives and did things like that, and they figured out. Oh, this huge infinite polynomial has to be what sine x over x is. And then to figure out it's also equal to this, that's where they said, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna factor that massive polynomial. <laughs> the related yeah, uh, right? So they said, uh, what are the roots of this? Think about it. So what things could I plug in for X and get zero? Pi, negative pi, two pi, negative two pi. And that's where all this comes from. So this right here is like one minus X over pi times one plus X over pi. <laughs> Because the root, we have the root pi and negative pi. But what other roots do we have? Two pi and negative two pi, and three pi and negative three pi. And when you multiply all that, when you multiply those together two at a time, you get this, 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 et cetera. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and then when you look at the coefficients of the two equations that are equal to each other, you can set just the coefficients equal to each other. Yeah. And so you just peel off the coefficient of x squared. Yeah. That's it. That's all you do. And then and then you get that crazy formula right there. Yeah. Yes. So 
So again, the factorial oh. notes those exclamation points just mean number one to less than number, etc., on down to one. You multiply all those together. Five factorial, five times four times three times one. Yes. Seven factorial, seven times six times five times four times three times six times one. Yeah. Okay. All right. Then to that, then you find out that it's pi squared over six. So uh, we just kind of went over everything really quick, so I don't need to review it all. These are the important equations that we're going to need to do next. Um, we as normal people will probably quit there, but Euler is just getting started. Um, there's going to be there are going to be a lot of equations thrown at you, a lot of numbers. Try not to get overwhelmed because it really is just algebra that we're going to be going through and what Euler is going to be going through. Um, so just uh, sit back, uh, relax, keep your hands and feet inside the ride at all times. So uh, Euler decided, well, sine of x over x equals the whole 1 minus x squared over pi squared times 1 minus x squared over 4 pi squared. Then sine of pi over 2 over pi over 2 is just going to equal all of that with your pi over 2's plug in for your x's. And the reason he's looking at this is because as x approaches 0 of sine of x, you're going to get closer to zero, but as x approaches pi over two of sine of x, you're going to get closer to one. So he's trying to figure out, well, what do I do? What, what happens if I plug in pi over two for my x? All right, so as we saw before, you just plug in pi over two for all of your x's in the other equation. Um, once you factor the pi over two out, square everything and all that, then one over pi over two is equal to one minus one over four times one minus one over 16, or just one minus all of the reciprocal, one minus the reciprocal of a square number times the next one and so on and so forth. Um, if, I guess I can use this. Yeah. If you, you know, take this number out here and flip it because it's one divided by that number, um, you get two over pi and then one minus one fourth is three fourths. One minus one sixteenth is 15 sixteenth. It's just one less than, the denominator is what that's going to be. Um, and then so then what he does is he flips it. He takes two over pi, flips that over, makes pi over two. And then he flips, the, he finds the reciprocal of all of these numbers and realizes, wait a second. It's just the uh, even numbers squared over all the odd numbers, you know, or all the, over the odd numbers squared. And you have two times two, which is four over one times three, which is three, and which is four over th three over four switched, flipped. Four times four over three times five is 16 over 15, which is 15 over 16 is reciprocal. And you can just keep doing that. I mean, I can go through all of them over here. 36 over 35 and 64 over 63. Thing is, that had already been discovered before by a guy named John Walters, but Wallace. that- Wallace. Wallace, sorry, yeah, John Wallace. Um, but uh, that didn't stop Euler because again, he is just getting started. Um, what happens next is Euler's like, okay, well, what happens if I just find the even squares reciprocals? What happens if I just add all those up together? So what he does is he looks at this and this is just, you know, one over, this is, oh, this is just one over two squared, one, over four squared, one over three squared, or nope, not six squared, one over six squared, and he does that for all of the even squares. Well, he looks at it and kind of has like an aha moment. What if he just pulls out a one over four and then like he just divides out a one over four, so he has one over four times all of the squares reciprocals. Well, as we know, those, what we just figured out is one plus one over four plus one over nine is pi squared over six. So he just does one fourth times pi squared over six and gets pi squared over 24 to be all of the even squares reciprocals. But he is still not done. What he does next is he looks at the odd numbers. This one's a lot easier than, uh, this probably is the easiest thing he does. Um, Cause if you think about it, if you take all of the numbers and you just get rid of the evens, you're going to be left with the odds. So that's exactly what he does here. He takes all of the numbers, all of the squares reciprocal, all of I forget, all of the square reciprocals, and then he takes all of the even ones and subtracts them, which you can see here because all of the all of the squares reciprocals is pi squared over six. All of the evens one is pi squared over twenty four. Subtracts them and he gets pi squared over eight is all of the odd numbers 
squared and just flipped over. Right. Um, but he's still not done. Um, and in fact, this is uh, one of his biggest things, which I think is fascinating and how he does it is super fascinating. He's like, all right, well, what happens if we take all of the numbers to the fourth power and then finds their reciprocals? So this is just one over one to the fourth, one, that's bad. one over two to the fourth, one over three to the fourth power and so on and so forth. And he's like, okay, what happens if I add all of those up together? So what he does is he takes these two functions here and he says, okay, well, one minus a constant times X squared times one minus another constant times X squared gives us this lovely little polynomial type of thing. And like he did before with the um, a sine of X over X, trying to find all of that, um, he's just worried about the coefficients. So he's just worried about what's outside of X to the fourth power. Well, if you um, multiply it all out, what he finds is when you multiply two of these together, you are left with the sums of the constants squared minus the constant squared added together, or the sums of the squares minus the squares summed, which I think is fun to say, uh, times one half. And that is the coefficient. All of that is the coefficient of x to the fourth when you're dealing with just two different constants. He's like, well, what happens if we use three different constants? So he has a, b, and c. Well, wouldn't you know that after everything gets factored out and multiplied together and all that, it's still one half times the constants squared minus the squares of each constant. And that's the coefficient. He's like, well, if that works for two things and it works for three things, why wouldn't it work for infinite things, right? So, oh, I just saved it. Okay, how do I, how do I go back? Oh, here we go, here we go, we're good, we're good, we're good. We are good to go. All right, so he takes our uh, equation we had before of one minus x squared over three factorial plus one over x to the fourth five factorial. But instead of worrying about this boy right here, he's concerned more with this one. And so he realizes, okay, what if I just did what I did before? You know, I had one minus ax squared times one minus bx squared. What if I just do that here and just make my a, my first, my first constant, uh, one over pi squared, which you can see here is what he does here. And that times x squared is what you get there. And he's my next one's gonna be one over four pi squared, you put that here. And so, so he's doing the same thing he just did. It's just with different constants, a lot of different, a lot of more numbers. Um, so he multiplies all of it out and he's like, well, as I learned before, it's the sums of all the number, all the constants squared minus all of the constants squared. And you can see that this is one over pi squared plus one over four pi squared plus one over nine pi squared squared. And you can see that all of these squared is what those numbers are. Um, and then he multiplies that by one half and that is the coefficient of X to the fourth. So he has one over five factorial over here and he has all of this times X to the fourth and he's gonna set those equal to each other but he still has to do something else. So this is just a lot of factoring out. So um, what he does first. So is this, is, can you go back to the previous slide? Yes, I can. So all the thing you're messing with right now is the coefficient of X to the fourth. Yes, all we are. One half, the thing multiplied by one half. Yes, all we are, all, all, we're, all we're worried about is this right here, uh -huh. and then this right here, pretty much. Is, so the one over five factorial, yes. and that jumps right there. You're going to simplify the one half. Yeah, yeah, all that's about to get simplified so that he can, he can set those two equal to each other. I'll have to figure that out. Um, so what he does first is he takes out a um, one over pi squared over on this side, but because it's because it's squared, it's actually a one over pi to the fourth. And that leaves us with uh, all of the squares reciprocals. And then he uh, does the same thing over here. He just takes out a pi one, uh, a negative one over pi to the fourth. And it leaves us with, as you can see, all of the, um, well, I'm gonna use a different color. He, it takes a, he um, 
it's one over all of the all the integers to the fourth power. Um, so then next, what he does is he. Uh, ooh, oh, wait, what's already there? Never mind. So he sees this and he's like, "Wait a second! We already know what that equals. It's just one. It's just the sums of all the squares reciprocals, which is pi squared over six. So this and this are the same thing, but you still have to remember about the, the square. Uh, and then he um, takes out. Uh, he takes this. He takes this out right here. He takes this out right here and brings it over here. He just multiplies the one half. He just multiplies one half by pi, one over pi to the fourth. Um, and then we're going to clear this first. Then what he does is he, mm, he factors it out. So he multiplies, he multiplies um, one over two pi to the fourth times pi squared over six squared, pi squared over six quantity of that squared. Um, and then he multiplies it out to the um, sums of all the numbers, all the integers to the fourth power. Um, when you multiply, when you do one over two pi to the fourth times pi squared over six squared, which is actually pi to the fourth over 36, you get one over 72 because these cancel each other out. And then you're just left with one over two times one over 36, which is one over 72, which is right here. And then he brings that over, which is minus one over two pi to the fourth. We're almost done. Um, so as we mentioned before, all we're concerned about are the coefficients of x to the fourth, which we saw earlier was one over five factorial. Well, one over five factorial is five times four times three times two times one, which is equal to 120. Um, I could do that if you want me to, but. I'll just leave that there. So that's five, it's five times four times three times two times one is one over is 120. So that's the coefficient on that side, on the left side. And then he uh, brings this over here. Uh, one second. He brings this to this side of the equation and then brings this to this side of the equation. So we're left, we're just left on one side, the one over two pi to the fourth times what we're looking for. And he equals that to one over 72 minus 120, just using simple algebra which if you subtract, if you do one over 72 minus one over 120, you get one over 180. Um, and then he just multiplies this across, uh, he brings this to the other side or divides it across. But when you bring this over here to this side, he's really just multiplying all of this by uh, two pi to the fourth. Oh, that's great. Um, and two pi to the fourth over 180, which is what this is right here is equal to pi to the fourth over 90. So Euler discovered that if you take the reciprocals of all of the integers to the fourth power, what you get is pi to the fourth over 90. Um, and he's almost done. He realizes you can do this with any even exponent. So he then goes to the pi, uh, he goes to uh, one over the number to the sixth power and finds that that is equal to pi to the sixth over 945. And then he does it with, uh, the exponent being 26 and finds that it is this huge number. Um, and he just can do that. He just does that with all the even exponents. Um, and so what you think would happen next is he goes to the odd exponents. However, he did not. Um, there's really no, nothing he has with odd exponents. And in fact, what I think is interesting is that even today in math, we haven't really made any advances in the reciprocals of all the x, all of the odd exponents, which I think goes to show how just how intelligent Euler is. The fact that he's able to get so far to a point that even we're able to get to today, and this is way before all of our modern technology and everything, it just goes to show how incredibly intelligent he is. And I'm not entirely sure how he didn't go crazy, but he does all of this. Uh, and this is just the first chapter on Euler. Um, it's crazy. He's he's crazy, uh, and that is all that we have. Cool. Can we go back to the previous one? Yes. So, I mean, obviously he wouldn't have just gone. So this is, this is one over two to the fourth, one over three to the fourth, or no, this is six, six. power. Yeah. One over two to the six, three to the six, four to the six, etc. Yeah. So obviously he didn't just go straight to the 26th. No, 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 no. He did all of it. Yeah. 
And actually, he would have needed to know, I mean, because when you did the fourth power, he needed to know the sum of the reciprocals of the yes, squares. Yes, exactly. You actually used that one. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so he just was doing more and more sophisticated algebra, moving up one step at a time from x squared to x to the fourth to x to the sixth, and just comparing those coefficients. Exactly. And so, yeah, I mean, I don't... <laughs> The book didn't say that he came up with a general formula for the even powers. Did yeah, he? he didn't. No, there wasn't a general formula. So I'm assuming he just literally sat down and was like, let's go to the next one uh -huh. and just kept doing that. Until yeah, I think I don't know a ton about Euler, but I think he knew. Uh, actually, I know I know a fair amount about Euler, but not not like a spoiler <laughs> scholar. Uh, I think he knew he was trying to find a pattern. Yeah, and he was very good at that, but I don't think he did. But there is a formula. There oh. actually is. Yeah, yeah. Someone had a, another question. How, how did you know it was a unique class? Like, you guys have done this. How did you know this? Well, I mean, Euler, he didn't, uh, so I think it was Trey that said he had memorized the first 100 primes. Yeah. But okay. that was when he was like seven. By the time he was 40, he, he probably had books of primes sort of memorized. He would have known. He would have known like what the prime factor, he, he would have actually factorized these things. He would have said, okay, well, this factor is as this and this. You can easily tell, uh, you know, that these two things had no common factors. And he would have done it because if you search for patterns, what you, tip, what you tend to do is you, you want to go down to the prime factors themselves. And usually that's where patterns will start to emerge. Um, but he didn't see a pattern. There actually is one. But the odd exponents is, is a well-known open problem. No one can do it. I mean, it's been a pro, you know, it's been an open problem for hundreds of years at this point. <laughs> right. So yeah. You keep so, it to yourself. So the reciprocals of odd, like you know, one, one over two cubed, one over you know, three cubed, etc. I mean, you can get that sum to any degree of precision. You would think that it would have something to do. I mean, think about it, just make a little conjecture here. This is the sum, the sum of the reciprocals of the squares was pi squared over six. So the formula involved the square of pi. The sum of the reciprocal of the fourth powers is pi to two is pi to the fourth over 90. So it involved pi to the fourth power. So the sixth power involved pi to the sixth. So the 26, the six 26 powers involved pi to the 26. So you would suspect that the sum of the reciprocals of the cubes would involve what? I cubed? Yeah. You would think. Okay. And actually, I mean, there's, well, now that we have all of this technological sophistication, you could actually basically try to figure out what number times pi cubed would give it. But no one can prove. <laughs> so, I mean, you could say, look, it looks like it's this times pi cubed, but no one can actually prove why that sum is equal to like pi cubed times some constant. That's still an open problem. No progress has been made since Leonard Euler. Okay. Uh, there's also a famous open problem called the Riemann Zeta uh, problem, which has to do with this, but it, but it has to do with imaginary numbers. It has to do with like looking at these powers where the powers aren't even necessarily integers anymore. Like they could be one half or you know whatever. So the so-called Riemann zeta function is something that uh, that there's been a lot of speculation about. There's a very famous open problem with that. Yeah. So is that like an overall formula for any exponent? Yes, it's like yeah, right. Well, it, it basically would solving the Riemann zeta function would solve a whole host of things. It's another one of those problems where if you did it, you'd be pretty famous. You wouldn't die like you would if you solved fast factorization. Uh, people wouldn't seek your seek out your life. For that information, but if you solve the Riemann zeta function, you would definitely be rich and famous. Oh okay, yeah, isn't there like a, a huge money surprise? Yeah. Like, aren't there like problems? I I remember reading something about it. Like, there's certain problems. Like, if you figure them out, or like whatever, and you get paid a lot. And like one of the guys in a recent mathematician or a while ago figured something out, but just turned the money down because he just wanted to. Yeah. So that was uh, that was Grigory Perelman. He's a Russian mathematician. There's the the most the most famous uh, or the, the most prestigious prize in mathematics is called the Fields Medal. And it's given once every four years. 
And sometimes there are multiple given out uh, in a given year, depending on like what, what transpired. Gregory Perelman solved something called the Poincaré conjecture that had been an open problem for hundreds of years. And he's a little, uh, Gregory Perelman's a little bit crazy. He, uh, he lives in his mom's attic. He had a job at uh, you know, a Russian university, but he solved it, published it, and everybody thought he was a crackpot. No one really knew. I mean, they knew he was kind of a, a weird guy, but he published this thing uh, and everybody thought, or he put, kind of put it on archive, which is like the place where you put stuff while it's in review to kind of stake out your territory. Everybody's like, all right, here's this crackpot. He thinks he solved the Poincaré conjecture. And it turns out uh, he did. Uh, and it was like, holy smokes, this guy did it. So uh, they wanted to give him the Fields Medal. They tried to give him millions of dollars. And he was like, eh, I'm, I'm good. Uh, he didn't want it. So he's a kind of an interesting guy for sure. Yeah. All right, so uh, Monday, uh, we'll actually, since we're kind of on the heels of number theory, on Monday, we will actually talk about, uh, we'll, we'll actually watch something about Fermat's last theorem. We'll actually watch a, a film, it's about 15 minutes long, uh, and it's it's documents Andrew Viles' proof of Fermat's last theorem. And it's it's for the lay person. It's supposed to kind of try to bring people along and explain what's going on. It's, it was a documentary put together by the BBC. It's really, really fascinating. So we'll watch that on Monday. Uh, the next group, talk about Euler doing some other stuff, number theory stuff, actually. Is that next Friday? Yeah. Okay. You guys good with that? Mm -hmm. All right. And when should we be expecting an email about the top spin thing? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't, I'm not, I don't control that, but I'll let you guys know. But I'm pretty sure they'll all be virtual, so you'll just be able to kind of tune in. Does that make okay. sense? Yes. Yeah. Are we having an exam and a like final exam pretty close together? Um, I'll let you know about that like on Monday, but I, I, I don't know. I hope not. I know that you hope not, yeah. but uh, we'll sort that out. Don't worry. Okay. Other questions? That's it. Thanks, guys.